This is Digital Anarchist at RSA San Francisco 2020. Welcome back, everybody. This is Charlene O'Hanlon moderating. No, sorry, I'm the managing editor. <laughs> it's the end of the day, I'm sorry. <laughs> managing editor at Media Ops, and we're here at uh, day two of RSA 2020, having some really great conversations, and I'm really excited about this next one with Matt Chioti, who is the CSO of Public Cloud at Palo Alto Networks. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for letting me here, Charlene. Yeah, Appreciate great. it. So you guys just put out the Unit 42 Cloud Threat Report. Am Sorry. I right? Yeah, Spring uh -oh. 2020. 20 edition. All right, so tell me what are the highlights? So some of the highlights, well, we did the first ever industry wide scale study of infrastructure as code templates. Wow. Right? So this is huge, right? Yeah. So for, for DevOps teams, this is something that they've been using now for a number of years. It's not new, mm -hmm. but for security teams that are finally starting to get, get an eye on this, this is something completely new. And, and what we found from the study of hundreds of thousands of these infrastructure as code templates, is that there is a massive number of vulnerabilities that are going to be, that are being created. So we found a couple things. So number one, we found that over 200,000 of these templates had at least one or more medium or high severity vulnerabilities. Yikes. Right? So a, a large number of them, right? Mm -hmm. And then going a little bit further, we found specifically that 23% uh, of them, 23% of Kubernetes mm -hmm. configurations from infrastructure's code templates created a container that ran with unrestricted permissions. Yikes. So you've got an application that's now running as root, and if that application becomes compromised, it is also it's, it's all running over. as root, it's all over, yeah. right? And then even going one step further, we found that about 27% of, of um, SSH resources mm -hmm. that are configured by Terraform, Terraform, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure as code templates, yep. expose SSH to the entire internet. So these That's are- That's kind of frightening. It is, and you know, you know, the thing is is that infrastructure as code templates has this, just this massive kind of positive and potentially negative to it. The positive mm -hmm. side of it, if leveraged appropriately, is that security teams, DevOps teams can have a common platform where they can build cloud infrastructure using this common language. Mm -hmm. Security teams can embed security standards. Right. But what we've seen, unfortunately, is that security teams have not really started to leverage these templates, and DevOps teams are making a lot of misconfigurations in these templates. So, do you think that's more a, uh, an issue of maybe the security teams don't really have the, the developer kind of background or knowledge base yeah. to, to be able to go in and say, well, you know, this is wrong, this needs to be changed, this mm -hmm. is a huge issue. Yeah. Or is it more that the developers, you know, uh, don't really have the security mindset? Is it or is it a, a combination of both? Yeah, so it's I think Charlene you're right. I think it's a combination of, of two of those things but also some something else I would add to the mix. So certainly one of the questions I asked so I had a session yesterday at RSA. I always love to ask, you know, show of hands, how many, you know, I assume most people in the audience are typically security people being mm -hmm. that it's RSA. Yeah. I love to ask, you know, how many here come from a software development background? I was surprised the number was a little bit higher than in the past. It was probably 20% of the room. Right. But usually when I ask that question, when I give various talks, it's usually 1% of the room. So you're right, part of it is that security teams don't come from a software development background, so they're just not comfortable mm -hmm. with, and they don't even know necessarily what questions to ask. And then you have it with, you know, with the development teams, where even though people like to say security is everybody's job, the reality of it is, is that you know, developers are focused first and foremost on getting features and functionality out. Right. And so right. I think there's that piece of it. But the third part I would add to it is that there hasn't been a lot of tools in the industry mm -hmm. to be able to enable developers to scan these infrastructure as code templates for these types of issues. And if it, if it has, it's been something that's completely disconnected from their CI CD process. Okay. So, this one of that's one of the reasons yeah. as well. That's that's interesting because you know I've been having the conversations for the last two days or so about you know DevSecOps and sure. kind of that that whole migration of shifting left security left in the the software development life cycle. Right. Um, but it's also been kind of a culture conversation that you know security and developers are never really going to work together no matter what because they speak different languages sure. and, and I personally don't buy that at all. I think that you know there can be a happy medium. And tools like what, what you're talking about right. I think will we'll do a, a lot to kind of bring those two factions together and so 
developers won't look at, at security as like, you know, this big wall that, sure. that's going to, you know, cause them to slow their process and they're not going to be able to get their code right. out fast enough and yada, yada, yada. And then, and then you know, the, the developers will, um, or the, I'm sorry, the security folks will look at the developers and they'll, they'll have maybe a little bit of empathy. They'll understand what the developers are going through. Right. And so I think, um, you know, I, I think the fact that there is there are tools that are now coming sure. out that are doing this, I, I think are gonna, they're going to do a lot to advance sure. that. But how long do you think it's going to take for that to happen? I mean, it's certainly something that we're seeing organizations, like as an industry, we've been talking about shift left for probably what, three, yeah, four, yeah. five years yeah. now. We should be shifted all the way over yes, at we this should point. Be, right, <laughs> but I think there was, a, there was a challenge with it. So even though the concept was out there mm -hmm. three to five years ago, the tools weren't there, and certainly when we look at modern software development processes, CI, CD pipelines, even you know the ability, is, A, the tools didn't exist, mm -hmm. but the ability to plug those tools in, that also wasn't there. That's now here today. We have right. that capability today, so now it's not a technology issue anymore. Now mm -hmm. it's a process and a people issue. And technology is usually not the difficult part. The process and the people mm -hmm. are usually the hardest part. So it does deal with culture, but you know, I meet with you know, clients all around the world, commercial enterprises, federal governments, and last week I was at a forum in DC <coughs> and there was Excuse over 150 me. attendees. This was all different parts of the government and it was a whole forum focused on DevOps and also DevSecOps. And so I was really impressed to see this. So this is something that I believe is just starting to kind of hit the mainstream. And oh, I'm really excited good. to see that, you know, federal government is also starting to get involved here. Yeah, well that's that is that is really good news. It is. So so what else are you seeing? What else came out of the report? Yeah, so a couple things. So one of the other things we looked at in this wide scale study was uh, we looked at a couple different things around infrastructure as code templates. We found unfortunately that about sixty percent of cloud storage services are configured in a way that logging is completely disabled. Yikes. And that yeah, it's scary, right? Because think about it, right? Um, you can you can try to do almost all the right things, but eventually um, if you know your number is up, you're going to unfortunately probably deal with a breach or mm -hmm. a potential breach at some point. Mm -hmm. But if you have logging completely disabled in your cloud storage services, you have no way to prove or disprove that you had you've had an event, right? So yeah, right. So this is kind of basic kind of security hygiene 101, and we see that at least you know from our scale, looking at hundreds of thousands of these infrastructure as code templates that mm -hmm. basic things like that aren't being done. Isn't that a, uh, excuse me, a regulatory compliance issue as well, if you don't have your logs on? Uh, absolutely, it can be. Uh, most mm -hmm. compliance standards require that. Of course, we mm -hmm. also found a, a shockingly high number of cloud databases that also don't have encryption enabled, which is a, you know, here in the US, HIPAA, uh, mm -hmm. PCI, GDPR issues. So yeah. again, you know, one of the things that we see that gets most organizations in trouble when it comes to cloud security. It's not the latest zero day, some you know, nation state doing an advanced persistent threat. Mm -hmm. It is usually has to do with simple misconfigurations. And in our, you know, we publish our cloud threat report twice a year. Mm -hmm. So in our summer of 2019 report back in July, our, one of our headline statistics, we found that 65% of cloud security incidents were the result of customer misconfigurations. And so that's why we dug a little bit more into this report to see the why, and right. I think we start to see that with these infrastructure as code templates. So, so what's gonna what what has to happen for that to change? Uh, there's 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 three things that we usually recommend, right? Mm -hmm. And none of these are again anything super advanced, but it's mm -hmm. about doing the basics right. So the first one is obviously you need to have and you need to get and maintain mm -hmm. deep cloud visibility into what's happening across your, both your private cloud environments as well as your public cloud environments. Organizations are still struggling to understand what they have from a basic asset management perspective in the cloud, so that's number one. Once you understand that, then you can understand your attack surface and you can understand just what the risks are. After that, what we recommend is that you focus on standardization of security mm -hmm. controls. So there's a lot of organizations out there, Center for Internet Security mm -hmm. has really good benchmarks for the major cloud providers use those types of standards, build off of those. And then the last one we talked a little bit about already, and that's shifting your security left. We really believe that that 65% number that we talked about, 65% mm -hmm. publicly disclosed incidents or misconfigurations, mm -hmm. we believe if you shift security left, you start scanning those infrastructures, code templates as part of the, part of the build process, as right. part of smoke test, mm -hmm. that you can eliminate those 
in your build pipeline, and that'll greatly reduce that number of incidents that may end up being in production or in production code. Well, that makes sense. That makes total sense. What about the issue of shared responsibility in the cloud? Um, that's something that's kind of come up here and there in the conversation, especially this year. Yeah. So, I, I mean, does that have any bearing on you know what 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 the what the threat report um, sure. found, sure. and you know, if so, what is it? You know, I think most organizations conceptually understand the concept of shared responsibility, mm -hmm. but I think where things start to break down, I was, was with a large organization last week, and they were asking, you know, can you help us internally, you know, with with the shared responsibility model? And as mm -hmm. a you know, as a security vendor, we're happy to you know help educate, but unfortunately, inside, you know, the larger the organization a lot of times they just get stuck of, well, well who actually owns this component of it, right. Right? right? It's actually somewhat easier in a smaller organization, simply because you don't have that level of complexity. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily you know, the shared responsibility model that gets people in trouble not understanding it, but it's actually figuring out who's going to do what. So simple things like roles and responsibility, right. um, you know, responsible, accountable, informed, like a racy matrix. I usually encourage organizations to, to really think about that, to make mm -hmm. sure they understand that there's not any gaps. Someone has to be responsible for all those areas. Mm -hmm. They need to map those types of things out. I think that's what has gotten a lot of organizations in trouble, right? Is just not understanding that. And then of course, you know, most organizations at this point of time, probably mm -hmm. 80 plus percent, are multi-cloud. They're not right. just using one, they're using two or three vendors. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, when you go from using one provider, there's complexity enough, you move to another one, it's not just like one plus one, we're talking about exponentially right. more complexity because everything is done very differently. Right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and and that's that's becoming a, a much larger issue as more organizations move to a multi-cloud <laughs> environment. Absolutely. So, um, what what are some are some of the you know the tips that you might be able to offer organizations that are moving into that multi-cloud environment to kind of help them at least be more aware of some of the security issues that they might be facing? Sure. So, I think a lot of organizations are tempted to try to deal with things you know, in a, in a multi-cloud world mm -hmm. with the way they did it on-premise. So trying to use old tools that are not API aware, right? Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not leveraging the cloud provider APIs. So we're big fans of cloud native security platforms. Mm -hmm. You might hear this term, yep. CNSP, cloud native security platform. Yep, yep. Um, so it's really important because again, from a security team, right? When you look at who owns most cloud accounts now, mm -hmm. it's usually DevOps, right? And so uh, things that the, the table has turned quite a bit yeah. over the last few years. So yeah. I think you know the recommendation is for security teams to really make sure they're evaluating their platforms to make sure they are cloud native, which means all cloud native means is that you're using tools that work natively with those APIs that don't disrupt that DevOps pipeline. So figure out what are the tools that natively work mm -hmm. with the tools that your developers are using mm -hmm. with the cloud platforms of choice and making sure they integrate and work well and help you also have that kind of a, I hate to use the term single pane of glass, but just a common place where you can go and mm -hmm. see your security status across not just one, two, but multiple clouds, including private cloud. That's what gets a lot of organizations in trouble, is when they have, you know, I've got to go to seven different consoles right. to try to understand different parts of my security, what's the risk, right? Mm -hmm. So having all those disparate point products, a lot of time leads to actually a greater lack of risk clarity, and that's the opposite of what most chief security officers I talk to want, right? They want that clear picture of risk clarity across right. multi-cloud. Right. What about the the idea of, of being able to show different, um, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of value stream management, like in, in, in DevOps where, you know, you need to see how something impacts something either being late or delayed or, or not working at all, how it impacts the rest of the, you know, it's like the butterfly yeah. effect, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so so is, is there something like that for um, for security as well when we're talking about a multi-cloud environment? I mean, is there that kind of single pane of glass for different personas that, that you know, need to say, need to see that information? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly Palo Alto Networks, we have a, a similar tool that does something like that. Well, there it's you called, go. It's called Prisma Cloud. <laughs> so Prisma yeah. Cloud is um, a, a, such a cloud native security platform that allows developers, that allows security teams, compliance teams to have, you know, again, that single dashboard where mm -hmm. they can see into their development pipeline, 
right? So if there's vulnerabilities that are introduced, they can stop them in the pipeline. And at the same time, they can also manage what's happening in their in their runtime environment as well. Okay. So yeah, so I don't think it's, you know, in the security world, it's not called probably value stream mapping, mm -hmm. but certainly, again, a lot of times it comes down to metrics, right? right? Being able to understand what it looks like across the board, and we help customers do that with Prisma Cloud. Excellent, excellent. So the Unit 42 report you said comes out twice a year. Twice a year. So this one that we talked about here today, that one was just released just uh, beginning of February, so it's okay. very fresh. All right. And then the next one will probably be coming out sometime uh, right around Black Hat. Okay, and freely available on the website? Absolutely, just go to unit42.paloaltonetworks.com and you'll find a link for the latest Cloud Threat Report. Awesome. Awesome, good stuff. Thanks Absolutely. so much, yeah, Matt. Thanks so much. All right. Hey guys, uh, I think that is the last interview for today. Um, please uh, check in tomorrow. We're going to have a raft of interviews for the last day of RSA 2020. So thanks for joining us today. <laughs>